look at the performance of Fundsmith Equity in 2023, I think that what, what the returns you delivered are, um, I think for the, for the average investor, they would be very pleased. Good question. Um, Good question. Stop there. <laughs> so, I think if obviously if you look at historical averages of what you might make from equities, I think you, you, you know it was a very good performance, but it it didn't beat um, sort of the, the 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 broader stock market. So, um, I don't think investors should expect fund managers to outperform every single year. Um, but I just wanted to get your thoughts. Do you feel obviously this is three years in a row that you you've lagged the market, even though you have. Uh, certainly, last year delivered a, you know, a decent, commendable performance. D d are you at the point where you want to tweak your investment process, or is that the worst thing I could possibly suggest to you? I mean, the short answer to that is yes, we do. But I'd like to back up first and talk about the performance. So, if you look at the three years you're talking about, the uh, the year uh, twenty twenty one, which is the first one, we underperformed the market by zero point eight of a percent when the market went up twenty two percent. Big deal, right? Frankly. So can we just talk about two years, really? You know, hmm. I mean, 22 percent up markets are not likely to be the sort of thing that we outperform, uh, which we're quite honest about. With people say so they always say in terms of relative performance, what do you think is the most likely problem for you? And we say, well, a raging bull market is a bit difficult because, frankly, an awful lot of stuff that we've never owned goes up. <laughs> you know? hmm. So really, we're talking about two years. And I would say several things about those if you've got the patience to uh, to hear us out. Um, one of them is you already touched upon interest rates in this. You know, we had a headwind from a, a very sharp interest rate rise and nothing we could do other than abandon our strategy would have got us out of that, basically. And we're not going to abandon the strategy. I will come back to the tweak that we're going to suggest in a minute. But, the, you know, the, uh, the abandoning the strategy is something. The next thing is let's just take the years apart, 2022 and 2023. Um, obviously, 2023, the thing that people have correctly alighted upon is the performance of the Magnificent Seven, so-called, how people love these labels. And the, the NASDAQ went up 43%, which is quite a lot, and the Magnificent Seven were two-thirds of that return. If you didn't own the Magnificent Seven, roughly in the weightings that they were in the index, you couldn't perform. I mean, it's pretty simple, really. And we didn't. Uh, we don't own any NVIDIA. Uh, we we don't own any Tesla. We're never going to own any Tesla. Um, we do own some Apple, but not very much because we bought it and took off and we sold Amazon during the year. And so, you know, we've got some, we haven't got others. There we are. And you might say, oh, well, you know, I mean, it's all we're all making excuses, but you could have just done the magnificence. Well, hold it for a minute. If someone wants us to, to uh, perform across years, presumably we should look at 2022 and 2023. We did a piece of uh, a screening, which Julian did, and we looked at companies which were big enough for us to own. So I can't remember the cut but about 10 billion, something like that market capitalization, and which had delivered 20% return across the two years. OK, why did we choose 20%? Well, it's a nice round number for a start, uh, but also that is nine and a half percent per annum compound. And nine and a half percent per annum is what the what equities have delivered for about the last hundred years. So these companies were big enough for us to own and they equaled or bettered the index uh, return over this period. OK, and there were 241. of them. OK, you should have a look at the 241. 45 of them are energy companies. About 25 of them are insurers. There are banks, mining companies, et cetera, et cetera. And there. consumer products, the two biggest companies in a sector that we would own consumer products were Decker's Outdoors, that makes Ugg boots, and a company that makes tasers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's the punchline of what I'm about to tell you. Only one of the Magnificent Seven made it into that 241 NVIDIA. The other mm. six didn't make it. So to so actually have outperformed across the two years that we really, I, I think, are worth analysing here, we would have had to have been heavy in um, uh, in energy companies. In fact, energy was pretty much the only sector that outperformed in 2022, if you look at it. Um, we would have been heavy in energy, insurance, banks, mining, uh, and some rather odd stocks in the sector. You know. Then, woken up on the 1st of January 2023 and said, I think we should really be in the Magnificent Seven, including some NVIDIA. Well, you know, if you can find somebody who can do that, great. Um, and I've got to say, let me know how it goes the year when they wake up on the 1st of January and make in exactly the wrong move, you know? Um, it's just not what we do. Uh, it's not what we do. So that, that sort of is where we are looking in the rear view mirror of the last couple of years. The only tweak that we really have thought about with the investment process is I think where we could have done better we can't affect interest rates. We're not going to change our strategy. I'm not going to bounce or we're not going to bounce from funny stocks in, in, in mining and energy into the Magnificent Seven. 
what could we have done better? Because believe it or not, we do spend a great deal of time thinking about what we do. Our selling discipline is the thing that we could have done better. Tweaking our selling discipline is the thing that we could have done better. Um, we sold some things well, and we sold some things not so well. And we've thought about how to improve that for the future, basically. That's that's really, I say, the thing that it comes down to in terms of something within our control. Because one of the things we say is we like companies we invest in who spend their time thinking about and trying to work on things that are within their control. And we're the same. We like to think about things that are within our control. Interest rates aren't within our control, you know. Um, but self-discipline is within our control. We think we can improve it. So, so are you, you sort of suggesting you need to be more patient? Because um, obviously you, you'd sold Adobe and Amazon last year only for their share prices to, 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 to then go up a lot. Is it, Are there examples no, of where if, you could have sold better? If only life were that simple. If only life were that simple. Um, I can point to a couple of things we sold which have gone down a lot since we sold them, Estee Lauder and PayPal. I can point to things which we've sold which have gone up a lot since we sold them, Adobe and Amazon. And I can point to things that we haven't sold, which have continued to underperform, Unilever. So it's not that if only it was just be more patient or uh, just pull the trigger as soon as you, you know. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Uh, I think the sole um, message that we get out, because we could have pulled the trigger earlier on Estee Lauder and PayPal, although we sold them successfully. And we could have pulled the trigger later or not at all on Adobe. Now. I think the simple lesson we get out of those. So you say, oh, well, Estee Lauder and PayPal worked. Adobe and Amazon didn't work. What's the difference? And I think the answer is when you've got a um, secular tailwind for a subsector, don't even if you're right to sell it, just go away and have a cup of tea, right? For a, a, a come back and, and think about it a bit later on, right? And that's that's Adobe and Amazon. We think our fundamental reasons for selling both of them were good. Um, I mean, Adobe, having walked away from the Figma acquisition and paid a billion dollar fee, seems to me to be a vindication of the fact that it wasn't a very well thought out acquisition. Um, but both of them were caught up in the whole AI sectoral hype last year. And we should have said, we're probably fundamentally right here, but we are, we'll, we'll come back and visit it in a couple of months time. See how this goes. That's the real point, I think. Uh, interest rates. So obviously interest rates are, are expected to come down later this year. Do you think this will provide a tailwind for companies in your portfolio? And perhaps if so, how, how might it impact? Uh, yeah, very probably. I mean, going up certainly provided the headwind. <laughs> be rather surprising <laughs> coming down didn't, didn't produce a tailwind, wouldn't it? A bit asymmetric, you might say. Um, look, what's the effect at work here? The effect at work here is about the duration of assets. So yeah, I'm sure you're aware of this. Basically, when interest rates go up, uh, long dated bonds, 10, 30 year bonds uh, fall in value far more than short dated bonds for fairly obvious reason. The short dated bonds can reach maturity and roll over in the higher rate a lot sooner. Uh, and so you know, the stocks that we own are affected somewhat like the longer dated bonds. We own companies on average, which are a bit more highly rated than the market. Uh, you know, I hesitate to use the word expensive because I think that's a different subject is about what you're getting for what you pay. But there's certainly what's not debatable is they're more highly rated in the market. Uh, and however you want to measure that, uh, you know, PE, whatever you want to measure it on, that means that, that the market in pricing them is discounting earnings further ahead. Uh, if your, your P is higher, it's giving you more years of E in the valuation, basically, uh, is what it's doing. So when rates go up, those kind of things which are more are uh, valuing a higher duration of cash flows or, or earnings are bound to fall more. And they did. You know, we underperformed uh, when the rates were rising in in 2022 and, and into 2023 as well. And um, that's the effect. So when that reverses, I would think that we'll get the opposite. Uh, it's rather like if you're confident about, about rates coming down, um, then should you buy short-dated bonds or, or long-dated bonds? Well, long-dated bonds, fairly obviously. And so, yeah, I would think so. Julian, you, anything more to say? I was just going to add that we're saying that it might have an impact, but it's not something we spend a huge amount of time thinking about. Our, our companies, I mean, for a start, our companies are very conservatively financed, so we, we don't think we need to worry about the impact yeah. of rising rates on, for example, their debt, because they don't have a lot or too much of it but other than that it's just something it's kind of background music to the the overall yeah. story yeah 
Yeah, Julian often comes out with something, um, on we're talking about interest, you know, but some people often ask about currency as well. What do you think of the US dollar or pound or something like that? And Julian has a good way of expressing it quite often. He says, imagine that we're 10 years on from that. Right, and that our portfolio of companies has done well. It's it's but it's delivered a better return than the market, and that's because the company's fundamentals have been better than average in terms of their growth rates and the returns on capital and the cash generation. And and we sit there and we sort of interview the companies, or you interview us, and we say, what caused all that? What's the likelihood that that, that the thing that will have affected us would be a what's gone on in terms of the companies and what they do in performing or interest rates or currencies. You know, when we ask them, you know, when we're talking to uh, Satya Nadella at Microsoft in 10 years time, assuming he's there and we're there, will he say, well, it's all down to the interest rates, really? <laughs> it's not very likely, is it? <laughs> I realise people get very worked up about it, but uh, it's not very likely in the long term that it will be a defining factor. Um, I mean, Terry, you're obviously, you know, you're highly experienced. I just wanted to, if, if I could just ask you, what, what do you think the, the most valuable lesson that you've learned as a fund manager is? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I may have touched upon it already, I think, which is stock, stock prices will eventually follow fundamentals, not the other way around. Right? But, mm. you know, when people are shouting at you uh, about something and it's because of stock price performance, one way or the other, whether it's Novo Nordisk is a good thing, or Meta when it was a bad thing, or Meta now is a good thing. Just try and try and focus on the fundamentals of the whole thing, uh, basically, and and ignore the noise. I suppose is what that's really saying. Ignore, try and ignore the noise. Right? It's a you know what you really need to do is think about the fundamentals of the business, valuation of the business, and so on. Uh, if uh, if we um, you'll probably see my last year, I, I said only half jokingly. I think I'm going to have a one stock fund. Uh, and the one stock each year will be a different stock, and it will be whichever one we receive the most criticism for uh, owning last year, because it appears to be a perfect negative indicator with people. They uh, they cannot, I mean, they and they really people cannot tell the difference between anecdote and data. One of my sayings is the plural of anecdote isn't data, right? <laughs> and Julian touched upon it already. The number of people you bump into, they go, "Well, you own Facebook, better now, but when it was Facebook, yeah. Well, I mean." My kids are not using Facebook anymore. I mean, it's rubbish. And you go, oh, where do you live? They go, Maidstone. I go, oh, how um, do you think they're getting on in Jakarta at the moment? <laughs> then they go, sorry. I say, oh, you're not kind of the future, do you think? I mean, is it just possible that there's something going on somewhere else in the world which is bigger than you are? And outside of, I mean, that, people get terrible sort of hometown biases on these things. It's, it's like the UK. People think that the UK, it's, they, they start to think the UK is the, is the world. Well, it ain't. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I mean, it clearly isn't, right? Mm. Do, do, I mean, Terry, do you still get excited by investing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I mean, I don't love every single minute. Sometimes it's like having a headache in a thunderstorm because anyone who says every single day my job is absolutely wonderful, I'm afraid is uh, is clearly not telling the truth. It's, that's not the case. It can't be. But yes, I do. I like the process of investing. I like discovering new things. I like rediscovering old things. I like the fact that we can reach back into our common experience and bring it to bear on things. I like getting it more right than wrong. Um, I like learning things. I mean, one of the things I really like is I like learning things. I think that's quite important if you're going to get it. And the other thing is, this is actually how I run my own money. This is not I'm not a fund manager sitting in a large fund management organisation uh, and I'm running the uh, sort of the emerging markets bond fund. And somebody says, oh, well, man, how much have you got it? You go, oh, nothing. I haven't got any money. <laughs> this, is, this is actually how I manage my money. It's actually how Julian manages his money, too. This is what we do. So even if we weren't doing this with third party investors and talking to people like you're doing it, we'd probably be doing exactly the same process. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. The same thing because we're talking to each other. It's quite a, you get quite a different perspective on on the stock market living in the US where I do as a, as opposed to living in the UK. The the if you live in the UK, the the asset class that you have the most interest in is residential real estate for very good reason that that's where all your money's tied up. Um, if you live in the US, um, people have much more interest in the stock market because the stock market is is where a lot of their money is tied up and and has been very kind to them. I was just looking at some numbers this morning, so. So since the start of 2023, there have been four companies in the in the all share index whose stock price has doubled. There have been 232 in the Nasdaq and 556 in the US market. I mean, this is just it's a really exciting market. And, and I'm not saying that 
that the funds with equity fund is is going to be investing in a lot of these things which are obviously tiddlers in terms of market cap but but markets are exciting and the u.s stock market is the absolute epicenter of where all the excitement is mm. yeah. i mean so terry you're going to be 71 this year do you do you plan on following the approach of warren buffett and charlie munger managing investments into old age or, or or julian are you going to sort of be taking over the managing the funds soon well i mean i think we can say yes to both of those <laughs> <laughs> except for the word soon um you know he's i mean he's like yeah i don't know if you you're too young to have watched are you being served the uh, the sitcom where well, young mr grace was always described as young mr grace being about 80 um but, and look yeah, I intend to keep going. Um, I don't feel that I can't keep going in terms of the the, my, uh, the, the, you know, the way that I feel about uh, sort of managing the money and coming into work and doing it. Uh, it's what I do. Um, and uh, I'm going to go on as long as I can. And when I can't, Julian's going to take over. And I don't think, you know, for one thing, there may be an event that I don't know about that changes that after all, you know. Uh, and therefore, you know, who knows what it will bring. But if I can, I'm going to go on for quite a while. And I hope Julie goes on for a long time after. We, 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 we both like the example of my father-in-law, um, who's roughly speaking 95. And until he was 92, um, he was a working every day as a plastic surgeon in Los Angeles. And we kept telling him that he should probably retire. And he said, uh, oh, absolutely. And then he would go into work the next day. And finally, the only way we could actually get him to retire was to sell the, sell his uh, his the, the building where his um, surgery was and give away all his operating tools. And even then he said he was going to rent another one and start again. So, you know, we, the again, again, living in the States, I think you get a slightly different perspective on retirement. It's um, it, it's, uh, you know, we we work because we. I see lots of uh, articles in, in particularly in the UK, news, UK newspapers about, you know, can I, you know, I've got X, Y, Z amount of thousands in the bank, you know, can I retire at 55? We don't want to retire. This is, I mean, this is great. Mm. Uh, I agree. So, uh, it's, uh, I would echo that. And I think, I think it's good for you, certain people not to retire. I think it's, it depends upon the individual. There are some people who definitely should retire. You know, they've got a great sort of a pursuit that they want to go off and do, and they can only do it up to a certain age. And if they've got enough money and then they're in case they're not really wedded to the, a career or their job, of course they should retire. I'm not saying nobody should retire. Of course they should retire. But that's not me. Right? Hmm. The other thing is, I think, I think it's important that you don't give up easily things that define you. You know, and and I think it, this is something that defines me and us. Uh, and so that's it. You know, we uh, I, I think we'll stick with it for as long as we reasonably can. Mm -hmm.